In this video chapter, we're going to study the extended Lincoln-Shaw family uh, modeling framework. Um, there are many models in this particular modeling framework, but the basic starting models are just uh, regression formulations of uh, weighted average link ratios. It turns out, as you'll see shortly, that a link ratio is one number divided by another number, and as a result of that, a link ratio is just a slope of a line, it's a trend, and an average link ratio is an average trend. The extended link ratio family, uh, I guess the starting model there is actually the MAC method, or the MAC model, which is just a uh, regression formulation of volume weighted averages. So let's um, go back into the system and uh, go back to MAC, look at the incurred data. And in the previous video, we studied the LRT module, link ratio techniques module. And this is where you kind of calculate lots of different types of ratios, different types of averages. You smooth them, you do whatever you like and store them and then create forecasts. But it's, it's got kind of a, a spreadsheet type environment feel to it or similar to a spreadsheet where you, the calculations are, are pretty simple. Uh, they're pretty easy and all these calculations uh, can be done in a spreadsheet pretty easily. Now what is it that you actually do when you calculate a ratio? So let's study this in more detail. We'll also do it graphically. So let's suppose you've got a cumulative array of any sort of numbers. Uh, the, link, uh, the extended link ratio family only applies to cumulative arrays, whereas you might remember the link ratio techniques module applies to an incremental array and a cumulative array. Okay, so let's suppose we've got numbers here, two uh, contiguous development periods, y1 to say y12, x1 to x12, and suppose we graph the y values versus the x values. For the sake of argument, let's suppose if this is y1 and this is x1, this is y1 divided by x1, well, the slope of this line is going to be the ratio. So the slope of this line is just the ratio. Let's calculate another ratio. Here's another ratio, y7, x7. So let's suppose that's y7 and that's x7. Well, the slope of that line is the ratio. So every ratio is the slope of a line between the number pair and the origin. All it is is a trend line or a slope. So an average trend here is equivalent to an average ratio. Average trend equals average slope equals average ratio. For instance, this is an average ratio, which I just did by hand. Okay. So Mac came along in 1993 and made the following two assumptions. Remember, models make assumptions, but the important thing is, is to find out whether those assumptions are carried by the data. So let's look at assumptions. Let's look at this model. If this model says that given x, the average value of y lies on a hypothetical average ratio or average trend line. So let's look at the first assumption. First assumption says, given this value of x, the average value of y, the next cumulative, cumulative the next development year, lies on a hypothetical average ratio line. Given this value of x, it lies on a hypothetical average ratio line. Okay. But the cumulative at the next period deviates from the average ratio line. So what's the order of the deviations? Well, there's a second assumption. Given x, the variance of y around the line, let's suppose, this is what Mac assume, is proportional to x. So let's review the two assumptions again. So given x, that's the average value of y. Given this x, that's the average value of y. However, given x, what's the variance of y around the line? It's proportional to x. So this variance is proportional to this x. This variance is going to be much larger because x is larger. Now, making those two assumptions and then using weighted least squares where the weight is the inverse of the variance. In statistics, usually a weight is an inverse of variance. It's the same thing what you do in credibility analysis. The weighted least squares estimator. 
The weighted average trend line ratio is the volume weighted average, or as the Europeans call the chain letter ratio. If you make delta equal to 2, you're changing the variance assumption, you're changing the weight, because a weight is a reciprocal of variance, you get the arithmetic average. So now we can generate these ratios by doing the regression lines. Let's do that. So now let's go to uh, back to the data and go to ELOF. And by default, we calculated the volume weighted averages, which is the MAC method. And let's see that they correspond. So now, if I go to my selections, I look at the chain letter uh, ratios, and I compare that to that column, it's the same set of numbers. If instead I want to calculate the arithmetic average, I change my delta to 2. So it's a different variance. Now the variance of y around the average ratio line is proportional to x squared, to the cumulative, to the volume squared, if you like, uh, rather than to the volume. <coughs> if you do that, you get the arithmetic average. So this column corresponds to this row. Now let's close this for a moment. And let's instead um, make the variance equal to zero. Let's look at the graph of the data. Let's look at the data itself. And let's also look at the ratios. And let's look at that, all the three tables together. And I'll minimize that one. Look at that. Now that's the data. So let me make this one a bit smaller. Oops, a bit too small. Sorry about that. So we've got the first two columns. That's the data. I guess the ratios we can make much smaller there. OK, well, let's see. This is the cumulative at development year 1 versus the cumulative at development year 0. Whoops. OK, so what we've done is we've graphed, we've graphed these numbers versus these numbers. OK, let's look at 1984. 1984 is, uh, sorry, um, yeah, 1984. 1984, the, on the horizontal axis, the x value is 5.655. On the vertical, the y value is 11,000. So it's this point. And if you take the vertical divided by the horizontal, which is the corresponding x value, the ratio is 2.04, just a little bit larger than 2. If you look at 1985, it's got a huge ratio, 9,565 9, divided by 1,192. It's actually this point, 9,565. Vertical is big. By a small horizontal, it's got a huge ratio. So now you can imagine that every ratio is basically the trend line, the slope of the line between the number pair and the points itself. So that 1984 has got a ratio of around 2, but 1985 uh, has got that huge ratio. It's around 8 or something. OK, huge ratio. Now, let's fit the red line, this red line, which is an average ratio. Let's do that. Just that one red line. In other words, we're only fitting a line between development year 0 and 1. We're only calculating one ratio. Let's do that. Now let's look at the residuals. We've just fitted this red line. 1984 has got a small negative residual. Residual is observed minus fitted. Another way, actually, you think you should, you should be thinking about residuals, it's trending data minus the trend estimated by the method. It's necessary for a model to be good that the residuals are random around zero. It's necessary, but that's not a sufficient. It's not a sufficient requirement doesn't mean the model is good. It's a necessary condition for the model to be good, but it's not sufficient condition for the model to be good. So that residual is negative. The 1985 ratio is huge. In fact, the corresponding y value is very far away from the fitted values, and that's got that residual. Now, why don't we fit a line now from 2 to 1? So it's that one. Why don't we fit the first two years? 
So it's that one. These are the residuals. Why don't we fit all the ratios and then use weighted by X, previous volume. So these are the volume weighted averages. These are the ratios, volume weighted averages. They're the same as in the LRT module. These are residuals of all the volume weighted averages between two successive conti uh, contiguous periods. The vertical axis. In each one of these graphs, that's development year, accident year, calendar year, and fitted values. The vertical axis is the same in each. So let's highlight this particular point. It's a value in 1982, development year 1, and therefore the calendar year must be 1983, the sum of the two, and that's the residuals versus fitted values. If you look at the residuals versus fitted values, you could see that the method overfits the big values and underfits the small. If you look at the residuals versus accident chairs, you'll see you're underfitting this accident chair and overfitting this accident chair. If you do a graph of the data, something quite interesting. You'll notice that 82 you overfit, sorry, underfit. And the reason you underfit 1982 is because it's got a low incurred development. 84 you overfit, and the reason you overfit 84 because it's got a high incurred development. So you overfit the high numbers, underfit the low numbers. And you can see this in this graph of residuals versus fitted values. Overfit the big, underfit the small. But you'll also see in the graph of the data, if you're fitting the red line, you're calculating an average ratio. To calculate an average ratio, whatever the weights are, you're fitting a line for the origin. But isn't a better line, a line with an intercept? The green line is a much better line. The red line is an assumption that is not carried by the data forcing the line to go to the origin. Any average ratio is always an average to the origin. So now we need to introduce an intercept. And that was introduced in 1994 by Murphy. So if you look at the graph of the data now, you need an intercept. The green line is much better than the red. The green line is much better than the red line for the periods 1 to 2 and so on. So what we do now, we go to model templates, and we do both. So now when you look at the residuals versus fitted values, they look straight. When you look at the residuals versus accident chair, they look at all straight. If you force the ratios to go through the origin, volume weighted averages, remember, are equivalent to MAC. It's the MAC method. You underfit the small, overfit the big. If you include an intercept, you're doing a much better job. And of course, just a graph of the data tells you immediately that you do a much better job with an intercept. OK, otherwise you've got a bias in your answers. So we've introduced an intercept. And now we have subtract the x from each side of the equation. So now we have y minus x becomes the incremental. Now when you use ratios and cumulative data, and you multiply cumulative by ratio to predict the next column of cumulatives, in essence, you're not really predicting that cumulative. You're really predicting the incremental because it's just conditional on the current cumulative. These two equations are equivalent. To predict the incremental, you multiply the previous cumulative by the ratio minus 1. To predict the cumulative, you multiply the previous cumulative by the ratio. The equations are the same. But in terms of thinking about the problem, you should really think in terms of the second equation. Because your prediction is always conditional on the current cumulative. In essence, you're just predicting what you need to add on or to subtract to the current cumulative to get the next cumulative. You know today's cumulative. So let's focus on this second equation. <coughs> of course, the solutions to each are the same. It doesn't matter which one you solve in your spreadsheet. You get the same answers, but at the same time, think in terms of the second equation. <coughs> 
So this is your cumulative array, that's your incremental array. Uh, that's your equation for cumulatives, that's your equation for incrementals. What if B minus 1 is 0? Well, that means that when you graph the incrementals against the previous column of cumulatives, the slope of the line is 0. B minus 1 is 0. It looks like this. This means that these incrementals are not correlated to this set of cumulatives, which means that ratios don't have any predictive power. Remember, the ratio equals 1 in the presence of an intercept. We're not saying that this ratio equals 1. We're saying that if you include an intercept, the slope of this line might be 1. Okay, so don't go to any of your friends and say, look, I've got a ratio that equals 1 uh, if they're thinking that the line goes to the origin. I have a ratio of 1 if, in fact, I include an intercept in my model and an intercept is required from the, by the data. Okay, so the reduced model then we would say that these incrementals are random with a mean A. The only least squares estimate of A would just be the arithmetic average of these incrementals. Now let's look at the data. <coughs> Can you see the incrementals versus the previous set of cumulatives? There's no correlation. When a cumulative is large, in a particular development period, the next column, the incremental, is not necessarily large. When a cumulative is small, the next incremental is not necessarily small. There's no correlation. One to two, no correlation. Never, there's never any correlation between the incrementals and the previous column of cumulatives. If you go to R, the regression table, you'll see that all the lines are pink, giving you the same evidence that statistically every ratio minus one is equal to zero. There's no evidence that it is not zero. So when you optimize, the system automatically just calculates the intercepts and sets the ratio minus one equal to zero. <coughs> so let's summarize the three models. <coughs> We've got ratios for the origin, which is MAC, volume-weighted averages for the origin. We then have what we call both, okay? But then it turns out that every ratio minus one of these green lines is equal to zero. So can you see if I now set the ratio minus 1 to 0, the estimate is close to 0. The residuals won't change very much. So if I look at the residuals now and introduce the Cape Cod, intercept yes, ratio equals 1, you'll see that the residuals don't change that much because the slope of the line, including an intercept, is approximately equal to 1. <coughs> you can forecast using MAC ratios to the origin do a forecast. <coughs> this is a forecast of incrementals. That's the cumulatives. In the incremental array, that's the mean, which you can obtain in a spreadsheet frequently, but that's the standard deviation. But none of these statistics are really meaningful because the method is not related to what's happening in the data. Remember, ratios don't have any predictive power. We found that. And you also need an intercept. You're going to use a ratio. The next step, you definitely need an intercept, otherwise you've got a huge bias if you look at the residuals. So you have a forecast summary. <coughs> you notice the coefficient of variation actually increased, which is a bit the antithesis of statistical principle of insurance. The normal one numbers you forecast, um, the standard deviation, usually the coefficient of variation, should actually usually decrease if you've got a good model. Um, now, let me see. I'm just going to pause for a sec. Now, when you, when you get to the last accident here, you are forecasting the sum of more numbers than the previous accident here. So usually, if, if the model relates the numbers in the triangle in some sensible way, uh, you will um, uh, the CVs would usually reduce. So let's go to the Cape Cod method. Now, you are relating the numbers in the spinning way. At least you're making an assumption. You're making the assumption 
that as you go down every column of incrementals, they are random from a distribution. This is random from one distribution. This is random from it's an assumption. It's got to be true for the data. We'll find out shortly whether it is, in fact, true for the data. When you look at the residuals versus accidents here, they do look relatively flat. So at, in the first instance, a quick diagnosis says that probably that assumption is correct, but we'll test it more vigorously, uh, more strongly a bit later. So when you do a forecast now and compare the answers, 59 plus minus 8 versus 52 plus minus 26. Now, so let's do a quick summary of this. If you've got a cumulative array, and it's got just by some set of exposures, E1 to ES. The same incremental array adjusted by the sun exposures. Let's make the issue of, of exposures. Um, uh, we'll discuss that later. Exposures are not an issue, just your favorite exposures. Now, let's suppose that for this development period, condition one is satisfied. In other words, when you graph these incrementals versus the accident year, W represents the accident year label argument, 90, 91, 92, they look flat. I call that condition one. You can do this in a spreadsheet, or you can do it by eye. You'll find out that in this particular case, when condition one is satisfied, when you graph these incrementals versus these cumulatives, there'll be no correlation. In other words, the slope of the line will be zero, so ratio minus one equals zero, meaning ratios will not have any predictive power. So under condition one, you'll find that ratios have no predictive power. <coughs> if you confine yourself to the ELOF module, to the ELOF modeling framework, you would calculate the average of the column of incrementals in each column. But then you would treat each column separately as a separate problem. You'll calculate the average of one, then the average of the other, and so on. But yet, when you'll go to the probabilistic trans family modeling framework, you will relate these development periods, how they related that will become part of your model, rather than treating each development period as a separate problem. Suppose now condition one isn't satisfied. In other words, when you graph these incrementals down the accident, even though you've adjusted them by your favorite exposures, there's a constant trend. So in a lot of cases, when there's a constant trend in these incrementals, there will be a trend in these cumulatives. Not always. In a lot of cases. So in a lot of cases, this model, especially a ratio model that includes an intercept, will have a certain degree of predictive power. It will have a certain degree of predictive power. There's no doubt about it. For certain arrays, you have to check this. Okay? For some, there'll be no predictive power. For others, there'll be a certain degree of predictive power. However, if you fit a trend through the incrementals, fit a trend through the incrementals. So now, you're adding another parameter. You have an intercept. W is the accident year labeling, 1990, 91, 92. Okay, the numbers are increasing along the accident year. 1990, 91, 92. What do you find out then? In most instances, you'll find that the trend in the incrementals has more predictive power than the ratio minus one, or the ratio. And in a lot of these cases, the ratio minus one will be zero. So I'd say in 80% of cases, you just use the trend, forget about ratio. In some cases, the ratio will have more predictive power than the trend, and you won't need the trend. In other cases, you might need both. For this data, we've only estimated an intercept. There's no trend in our model. When you look at residuals versus accident shares, it seems diagnostically there's probably no trend, but let's test it for every development period. So we're now going to load trend and ratio. So it's a full-blown family. And we're going to optimize twice our regression table. And you'll see that only for one period is there a trend. There must be in development year two. So if we check the data, graph of the data, trend and ratio and go to development year two, you will note that there is a constant trend. Well, actually, it's not constant. There's a growing trend. Uh, growing, the numbers in development year two versus accident year are growing, okay? But not at a constant trend. 
yet the incrementals versus the cumulatives are not correlated. So for this particular development period, condition one isn't satisfied, condition two is, but this model still has no predictive power. Okay, so we've covered two conditions so far. In the next chapter, we're going to look at the probabilistic trend family. Now, data either satisfies condition one, zero trend, as you go down the development here. In that case, ratios will have no predictive power. Ratio minus one will be zero. And if you confine yourself to the extended link ratio family, you'll be calculating the average of every column of incrementals, but then you'll treat every development period as a separate problem, when in fact it's not. Condition two says constant trend, positive or negative. In most of those cases, you'll find that the trend does a much better job than using a ratio. Then if you use the trend in every column of incrementals, a different trend, you would, not, you would be treating each development period as a separate problem in ELOF but you gain much more efficiency in terms of modeling if you switch over to the probabilistic trend family where you can actually relate the development years. Now, I'd say that around 50 to 60% of data sets don't have a constant trend, but they don't have a constant trend from there to there because the calendar year trend is not constant. If this calendar year trend is not equal to that trend, it's different, 10%, 15%, it's an axiom that that trend is not equal to that trend. That trend is not equal to that trend. So that's condition three. So in other words, we're trying to going to look for a modeling framework when we get to PTF that has calendar year parameters in it because that's what happens for a lot of data sets. But irrespective of that, you'll see in one of the other studies that the MAC method, volume weighted averages, formulated as a regression, the MAC method, does capture a calendar year trend. The method does actually do that, but you don't know what the trend is. So you've got no descriptors in your ratios of what trend the method actually captured. So if I go back to the MAC method, ratios only volume weighted average, that doesn't tell me what the trend is in the actual data. Okay. All right. Well, that's another chapter. Okay. Thank you.